I think we're not logical people. I think we're biological. I would always, always recommend you like taking care of your body first. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode, we're going to dive deep into the science behind manifestation, meditation, and mental health. We're going to be understanding our brains on a deeper level and share some brain hacks as well. Our guest today is Jonah Rose. Jonah Rose is a certified brain health professional, licensed neuronuclear medicine and psychiatric nurse. She has worked in mental health for eight years now and spends her days studying the brain. Jonah is passionate about connecting science with psychology and even spirituality. Outside of her clinics, she works to empower over 200,000 followers on TikTok with knowledge and resources to expand the mind and change your brain. This is a really good one and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Jonah. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling excited. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I, I'm curious because you talk about manifesting and then you're also in like neuroscience, you do brain scans for work. So which one came first? Your interest in like brains or manifesting? Um, definitely in brains. I've been working in mental health and psych for over eight years and that was more of my fascination. And then we were starting to talk about basically the science of manifesting somewhere along the line, like in our brain as an organ, there's different things that connect to spirituality. And manifesting to me at the time was like, like a little woo woo, because I've been in science for so long. But then the more I was around um, everyone in my clinic, it was like they're saying it as a fact. Um, and I started getting into it myself. And I was like, wait, this is real. Like you see the proof happening right before your eyes. So how long ago was this when you started getting into manifesting? Um, this is about three years ago. Um, I did my first brain scan on myself um, and I saw my brain and how it works as an organ. Um, it took three years after like getting off all of my medication I was on, on like a lot of antidepressants and anxiety, a lot of different things. Once I got off, on, um, once I got off of them, um, I was like, okay, I saw my manifestations happening literally right when I cleared uh, my brain. Wow. And tell me about like in your job, because you're saying they were talking about manifesting and the science of manifesting at work. So what kinds of things were you learning? What were they talking about? So in the brain, there's an organ called the pineal gland. And this pineal gland is supposed to be a receiver. You know how radios have those antennas? We have one in our brain. It's literally working like an antenna. So you're receiving information through an organ in your brain called the pineal gland. And so that's what I, I got interested in manifesting because they're saying it like, like it's a fact because you can see it in our scans. So you see that gland. I've heard of that gland as well in spirituality terms, but in people call it the third eye chakra. Exactly. <laughs> so um, in scientific terms, what's the purpose of that gland? Because like, did I don't know if this is true, but I heard that that gland has like the same cells as your eye. Um, but yes, the pineal gland is supposed to be, um, it is an energy field. So it's a crystal. If you look at it, at the actual gland, there is a crystal in it. So it emits a electromagnetic field around it. So that crosses over to like third eye chakra. A lot of people say there's energy centers in your body. That one just happens to be in your pineal gland and it's emitting the signal. And so when people are saying like attracting the life of your dreams, it really is like the signal that's being broadcasted through your pineal gland. Okay. So you're saying it's a receiver and broadcast? Yes, it does both. It's kind of like uh, when you're talking to someone on a walkie-talkie. This is like my best explanation for manifesting. Um, when you're tuning up your frequency, imagine a walkie-talkie. Say your lower vibrational emotions are like zero and 10 would be your higher vibrational ones and five would be contentment in the middle. If you're tuned into like channel one, you're only hearing and receiving and talking on channel one. You can only receive the thoughts Talk in the thought of channel one, which is the lower um, vibrational emotions like anxiety and depression. You know, when someone's really, really sad, they can't even think positive thoughts. They can't even hear you. Even though you're saying a lot of great things, they're not even able to receive it. Say you're complimenting, complimenting someone, it's hard for them to receive because they can't physically <laughs> receive those compliments. And then when you tune up the scale of your um, 
your walkie-talkie so you get to attend. And that's joy, excitement, happiness, love, gratitude. And then you're saying um, a compliment or gratitude um, to someone. They're able to receive it better. And then they're able to like see it for themselves. Like, wow, I'm thankful for this. Why I'm thankful for this. Because those thoughts are received. Um, they're getting into them. And then they're also being able to speak it out. And that's like, a little, you know, when you're vibing with someone, it's like tuning into that person's frequency. <laughs> But there's a science behind it and you can quantify it now. Okay. What do you see in a brain scan? You basically inject a radioactive tracer that goes into your bloodstream and it's going through blood flow. Um, and I do neuro, so it goes straight to your blood, um, to your brain. Um, and your brain controls everything you do, the way you think, the way you feel, the way everything. Your brain literally is a control center for those things. So when we're looking at a brain scan, you could have your brain as a whole organ. Everything's completely intact. For example, like if you were to get a CT or an MRI, that's looking at the structure of the brain. You have a brain, everything's there, but just because you have it doesn't mean you can get adequate blood flow to certain areas. So for that, like um, certain parts of your brain controls different things. So if it's the front of your head, it's like your intellect, your logic, your thinking, your judgment. And then the um, on the side, your temporal lobes, those are your mood and your memories. So every single part of your brain controls certain things. The blood flow is going to go into certain areas and control those things. So certain people, like, they can't think logically. And you say, come on, just think. And they literally can't put blood flow to that side of the brain. I guess my question is, like, what are you guys going to study and learn from looking at the brain? Is um, Mental illnesses, really. Mental health, mental illness. Um, Here's a little brain scan um, that these are, this is a healthy, active brain. Okay. For those who aren't watching the video, they're very colorful, like a rainbow. <laughs> I'll send you pictures so you can pull it up as well. Um, this is the front of your brain, so right here. And if there's less blood flow there, like say that there's a hole, this person would have like ADD because they're not able to focus and concentrate. So mental illness, um, I'm going to flip it over and this is called the active view. Um, right here is an amygdala, right there in the middle. And that's basically your fight or flight response. Um, usually some people's amygdalas is really, really bright. So mm -hmm. that is indicative of anxiety. So someone mm -hmm. really has anxiety. And so when you have those things, um, you have different places where you could see like depression, anxiety. Um, those things are very much correlated to like manifesting to me because that those control your emotions. And um all about manifesting or what's the thing about manifesting is it's about your emotions, it's about your feelings. So if your brain's not working well, it's not because you're not saying your affirmations enough times. It's you have to work on the organ first. I don't okay. think we're logical creatures. I think we're biological. So we're getting blocked by our biology. And so first we should uh do that first before we start mm -hmm. getting to it's it's hand in hand really spirituality and and biology, but it kind of works together. And if your biology is there, then it's much easier to yeah. like, feel better, to think better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you're saying biology, it's literally taking care of your brain, making sure you're like getting into that calm state and like, right, taking care of all those things that are not working correctly. And I think that's what it is. Exactly. So um, one of the things is like getting into calm, say like meditation, like meditation is like a really big part of spirituality. Um, but someone has a hyperactive amygdala and their body's in a constant state of fight or flight. And for me to say, hey, you should calm down. <laughs> you should relax. It's literally like this organ's going so fast. And it's like, how, how? I mean, I can show you an example of what a hyperactive amygdala looks like in reference. But like, say it's like this big hole right here. Or sorry, this big, um, big circle thing. And then it's supposed to be like, small and nothing. You see the difference, right? It's just an overactive brain. Okay. So what was the aha moment where you were, where it all made sense? Kind of like you tied your work with manifesting. Honestly, my first TikTok video, I didn't, was not planning. I'm not very active on social media, um, but I cleared my brain scan and I was like, wow, I, I did this. Like, you know, when you you were working out for, for a while and you actually see the results, it takes a while for you to see the results. And then once you see it, I'm like, wow, it works. And I made my very first video 
the, the next day that it worked and it went mm-hmm. viral and then the next one went viral. And it literally, it's like your limiting beliefs, I believe, are tied into that because you don't even know what's going on in your brain. And once I cleared the inflammation, so to speak, in my brain, I saw a lot of things unfold before my eyes because most of the thoughts that I had that were recurring were like my limiting beliefs. Once I was able to clear that, I saw the physical correlation to my brain scan. Mm. Are you saying you scanned your brain before and after? Yes. Yeah. That my after scan. So right when I scanned my, my saw my after scan, I was like, it worked. Well, one, the, the biggest thing for me is like, I, again, I've been working mental health for so long that like, I wanted to get off my meds. I think, you know, you know, the phrase like hurt people, hurt people. I believe heals people, heal people. Ooh, so when that. you healed, <laughs> when you healed for yourself, it's like you want to like, hey, you can do this. Like you could do this for yourself. So for me, getting off on my medications and then still being able to heal my brain, I'm like, you guys can do it. It's going to take some work, but you can do it. Okay, let's break that journey down, right? So from where you were at the beginning to how, how did you start to heal your brain? I I love that because of your job, you're able to scan your brain like before and after. So what did you do to start healing yourself? Um, At first it was a lot of, I have no idea, but let's just like Google how not to be sad anymore. (laughs) Um, And then you get to like meditation and I'm like, you know, everyone knows to meditate, but nobody knows why. Um, and then then I started looking at the science of meditation. So I'm a really big reader. I like to read everything everywhere, like anything that I can find. So the science of meditation is really just breathing. Um, if I can go into that, like um, meditating and breathing through your nose is really, really important. So, you know, when you feel anxious or anything, you everyone tells you to breathe. Mm-hmm. But people are breathing wrong. You're supposed to breathe in through your nose. And so when you're learning meditation for the first time, you learn you're supposed to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. A lot of people, when they're going through like anxiety or fear or whatever, they start breathing through their mouth. It's automatic mm-hmm. response. Every time you're like hyperventilating, you're breathing through your mouth. They're like <sighs> when you're running and gasping for air. <sighs> but people do that throughout the day. And when you breathe through your mouth, um, the response in your body is like, we're in a fight or flight response right now. We're not thinking logically. We're not trying to calm down. We're going through a fight or flight response. So it it, um, makes you more anxious to prepare you for the situation at hand. In meditating, you learn how to breathe in through your nose because when you breathe in through your nose, it calms your system down. You are in this rest and digest versus your fight or flight. Yeah. Love it. So that's the first thing you did is like learning to meditate, calm down. And then what else did you do? (laughs) When I hear meditating to me, like when I first (laughs) heard it, I've been in science for so long. So any time it sounds like too woo, I'm like, okay, whatever. I have to almost convince myself like, no, there is like a physiological aspect that's happening within us. That's why meditating works. And so I went and looked for it and I was like, wow, meditating works, you guys. (laughs) Yeah, because this is what's happening in our chemistry. Now you're like um, releasing the hormones of resting. You're releasing the hormones of just being calm and happy versus like when you are in your fight or flight response, because you automatically switch your mouth to mouth breathing when you are anxious. You're like (sighs) hyperventilating panic attacks. Um, But people don't know how to control their breathing and people aren't taught to breathe. Um, So when I started doing meditating, I've already automatically felt my body calm down even though like everyone tells you to breathe and I'm like, I am breathing. I have to breathe. This is a normal response for everybody. <laughs> but to control your breathing, it's it's different. <laughs> um, what I did next, I just I just read a lot of books. And you know, when you're in your self-help journey, you're like, oh, does this work? And you're like, oh, let's just try this and this and this. And I did, that wasn't enough. I had to look look for why does it work? Because I can mentally visualize if that was able to work or not. Yeah. I think what I like about you, what, why a lot of people follow you is you bring the scientific reasoning behind all these things you hear about, like affirmations, manifestation, spirituality. So I, I, I want you to share your knowledge with our audience. Well, I do like to go for the brainwave states. Like that's the main thing that I'm really passionate about is brainwave states. So you do your brain scans, you see the an anatomy of your brain and the function, how it works. But when you look into like neurofeedback, 
Um, there's this thing called an EEG, an electroencephalogram. It's basically like an EKG for the heart. You know how it goes. Do, 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 do. Um, you put it on your head. You put the um, lens on your head. And basically, it measures your brainwave state. So a lot of um, people talk about this. It's you're in different brainwave states throughout your day. Just like you have different heart rates throughout your day, you have different brainwave states. When you meditate, you are in a different brainwave state. And so you can even um, say right now when we're talking, you're asking me questions, I'm in a beta state. So beta state is just your regular awake state. I'm pulling from my own memory banks. I'm speaking what I already know. I'm not pulling from any other consciousness from what I already know. And then you get into the next state, which is alpha. It's like this borderline between like awake and asleep. It's like right when you wake up in the morning, you're usually in alpha. Like you're a little groggy, but you're not completely mm -hmm. asleep and you're not completely awake. Um, do you, are, are you familiar with Jose Silva? Mm, yes. Jose Silva. Yeah. Silva, um, Silva mind control method. Yeah. He highly talks yeah. about being in alpha state. Um, mm -hmm. a little thing about me and I mean, I did the Silva mind control. I know mind control sounds very funny to say right now as I said yeah. it, but it's not controlling other people's mind. It's controlling your own mind. Um, so when you get into this alpha state, he basically trained a lot of people. Um, they made them to be like his first, he trained his daughters. At first, they weren't doing it great at school. And eventually, they were like straight-A students. And then they were like extraordinary people intellectually. So they, he trained them to go into alpha. He started training a lot of people to reach this alpha state through this meditation and all of these techniques. And in that, you're able to absorb more information in that brainwave state. You can literally learn a lot more. So again, you're in this receptive state, yeah. learning and becoming more limitless in what you, you're doing and thinking. But you first have to get into that state. You can learn a lot of things in beta, this awake state, but you're almost kind of like this habit that we do. We press the alarm, we wake up, we get out of bed. We're like almost um, like living in habit. Yeah. When so you you're more the of next a sponge state. in alpha. Yeah, you are way more than sponge. You could like receive so much more. You could retain so much more. Um, and the next is delta theta. Um, Jose Silva actually didn't talk about delta theta, but that's just how science is. It's like he stopped at alpha, but... There's now we're figuring out more and more about Delta and Theta. Um, my best example for Theta is like the Thomas Edison example when he like holds a ball before he goes to sleep. Um, have you heard of that? <laughs> No, <laughs> it's basically it's um, basically before he like makes any of his inventions, he'll take a nap and he'll hold a metal ball off the edge of the bed. Once he drops it, he's in this awake and asleep state and he calls mm -hmm. it Theta. This is the creative state. It's the mm -hmm. state where like you're almost like getting downloaded and information that you did not have in your brain. So in beta, you have like your archive of memories. Like you can pull like two plus two equals four. I'm just giving that to you as information. Um, whereas in theta, you ever just had like a really great idea? Or you're like, whoa, where did this come? It did not come from me. It just got downloaded into me. I just received it from wherever I received it. That's tuning your frequency up into theta. And just like um, that radio example that I, I'm sorry, the walkie-talkie example that I said earlier, when you tune up your frequency, you're able to be receptive of the universe, God, your source's energy in that state. And so every single state, there's there's something to be either received or to be given. And so when you're meditating, um, especially when you're manifesting, I have been manifesting literally everything when I get into that state. Oh, the theta state, where you're kind of in that like in-between state. That's like the best time to manifest. Yes. It's like, right, you know, a lot of manifestation coaches, they're like, right when you wake up and right before you go to sleep. It, that that is a, that is the time because your your conscious mind is not yet really awake to build up your barriers of self and belief. You're like almost unconscious. So you, you're not you forget stopping your getting belief. In that state, yeah, like, exactly. You're in the unconscious or some somewhere yeah. there, somewhere it's like you're, it's dreamlike, right? Like you just finished having a dream, and now you can continue to dream, and you're not in your belief system anymore. You're not in your limiting beliefs, so you can almost like think of anything you want. Um, I really like when I started manifesting. I was putting myself on the EEG, like when am I in beta? Because if I do my affirmations in beta, it's not as like, it, I don't know if it would happen. You just have to repeat it. Some people say, how often do you repeat your affirmations? Like when you're in theta once. But most people don't know when they're in theta. So they're like, oh, I'm just going to do it every single hour of the day. And maybe I'll hit it. <laughs> 
Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Fenty Skin. The Fenty Skin Starters are your daily three-step pore-busting regimen to help you get smoother, brighter, and tighter looking skin. Step one, get clear. Unclog your pores and remove dirt, oil, and makeup without stripping with a purifying total cleanser. Step two, deep treat. Power down on pores, dark spots, and shine with their fat water toner serum. Step three, lock and shield. Lock in hydration, reduce the look of pores, target discoloration, and prep skin for makeup with a lightweight Hydrovisor Invisible SPF 30 moisturizer. The result? Pores that play small, tone that gets even, skin that serves balance, and makeup that looks better. Get the Fenty Skin starters now at FentySkin.com. And best of all, Fenty Skin is giving our listeners an exclusive promo code to try out the starters. Head to FentySkin.com and use code LAVENDER20 for 20% off a starters bundle, OG or fragrance-free. Yeah. So what you're saying is because of, from what we know about brain waves, like there's a more efficient way to manifest. It's not about all day, although you can do that. But I also agree with you. Like I've, I always like try to do manifestations before I go to sleep or right when I wake up, or I'll listen to like audiobooks or, you know, just like manifesting ish audios, like as I fall asleep, because I know it's good. Yeah. For me. <laughs> but we but, know to do it, but we don't know why. Right. Like you have, like, you gave us the scientific explanation why that works better. And also dirt, yeah. why meditation will help that process as well. Yeah. When we're pulling our hypothesis, like we're looking at spiritual textbooks, like in spiritual texts, it's literally like right when you wake up and right when you go to sleep. How did they know when we're measuring someone's brainwaves say throughout the day, it really, you're in theta and alpha delta theta more in the morning and when you wake up. And then they also say like 3 a.m. is a very like spiritual hour because you're like, your conscious mind is done. Like it does not want to talk anymore. <laughs> so your self limiting belief is completely down. All you're doing is just- That's why you can be really creative at night. <laughs> For some people. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Cause it, you're basically trying to get to the place where your brain, like you're not in your current belief system. Cause a lot of people are held back by their limiting beliefs and that's your conscious brain. So all of these magical things can happen when you turn that part off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you could also rewrite it. You could also rewrite it in your unconscious state. So when you're like, I mean, this is going into like hypnosis states. Well, we're always in hypnosis. If like when you're going on a drive, you ever like drive and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I think we all know, we have all experienced that. Yeah. When I say hypnosis, people are like, oh, like, you know, again, woo woo, act like a chicken, very theatricized. Um, but hypnosis is a brainwave state to me. It's like you're in theta. You are so like, like subconsciously like receiving everything that you're just going to do it. Like people do that. People have re received information and just do it automatically on a lot of their limiting beliefs. Like the way that they, um, like, I don't know, just brushing your teeth. I always brush my teeth with my right hand. Like now you're brushing your teeth with your left hand. It's literally we're an autopilot mm -hmm. when we have our belief system. I'm not going to call them limiting beliefs. But they're like just any belief system, we've downloaded them subconsciously. So when you um, get into this hypnosis state, you can rewrite your trauma. So I work like in you, mental health. And to even tie that into mental health, you ever like, um, you're talking to a friend and you're telling them a very traumatic story and you're not even crying, you're just saying it. But then the next person you tell, it's like, I'm crying, I'm angry, I'm like, I'm feeling all of this emotion. It's the same story, it's the same words. But why is it in one way, one person, one way, you know, like you're saying it like dry, you're, you're not putting any emotions to it, like to your therapist. <laughs> and then you go to your friend and you're crying to your friend or something or vice versa. You cry to your therapist, but when you tell your friend, you like don't like exhibit any emotion. You are in a different brainwave state. And in that brainwave state, you're experiencing different emotions and you're able to rewrite certain things in each different emotion. So for me, like therapy is better <laughs> if you're able to access the brainwave state first and then talk about it so that you can rewrite it versus just saying it in beta. And then you're just, it, it hasn't rewrote in you. There's nothing that was healed in you. So what is your, if you were to teach someone listening how to rewrite, like pick a limiting belief and how to rewrite it, what is the process? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things is most people don't know their limiting beliefs. So I wouldn't even start like, hey, pick a limiting belief. It's 
your body knows your limiting beliefs. You, when you like just go through life, I, I really believe in just being present. Don't look for your traumas. Like you'll find it in front of you. Well, like it's like a life is like a Rorschach test. Rorschach's the ink blot test. Like you'll just be walking in and there's this tree and I'm like, this tree reminds me of the one I fell out with when I was a kid. And now I'm like, oh, and then now a tree is triggering me. I think triggers are our biggest lessons because like there is a clue to what you need to heal. Like if this situation gets you angry or if this brings up an emotion in you, like there's your clue. <laughs> right? Yeah. So don't look for a limiting belief at all. You will find it when you are prepared to work on it. <laughs> so right now, like um, people's limiting beliefs, like my, or so limiting beliefs, sorry, uh, like their trigger is like their home, something in their home. So just, I'm just so anxious and angry. I'm like, oh, what is it about my home that's making me anxious and angry? And then that's when you would start your limiting beliefs. I don't think people should like look for the, uh, like, you know, people, we all know that we have trauma, but I don't think we should look to the past. Like what part of, my past do I need to heal? It's going to it's gonna apply to your present because you've carried it with you for so long. So don't look for it. It'll happen in front of you. And it also reminds you to stay present. When you're staying present, like you're not worried about the past because that gives you depression. And when you're staying in the present, you're not thinking about the future because that gives you anxiety. So when you're here, whatever's in front of you, this is what we're going to do for this time right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, so... So the step before, you're like, hey, pick a limiting belief. It's like, just go through your day. And if you feel like your heart closing, it's like, you know, your heart racing, your hands clenched, your palms sweating, like something's going on there that your body's trying to tell you. And that would be the thing that you're going to work on today. <laughs> okay. So, so how do you work on it? I think there's a level of self-awareness on like, first, like, why am I experiencing this? I always like... uh you just got to ask yourself why. I do like seven layers of why. Do you ever do? Have you heard mm -hmm. seven layers? Yeah. Why? You just yeah. ask yourself, like, usually um, the answer is not ever the first, or uh, the, the answer is never the first answer that your brain thinks of. It's like the seventh one or, you know, maybe five or six, seven. So when you find it, um, what would be like a common self that would be like on money? You know, money is the biggest one for everybody because we've all formed a belief about money. And then you go through your seven layers. Oh, well, I just want to be free, financially free. I just want to do whatever I want. Um, I just need money. And then so you're like, okay, I'm looking for freedom. And then I'm looking for this. Everyone's a little different when they get to the end. Mine was on validation. <laughs> like, I just, like, I just want to be like, I just want to know and show people like I'm worth something. <laughs> so that was my limiting belief on money. And so when you're working on that, what's, what's funny is, like you meditate on that. You feel that feeling, like that feeling of validation. What does it feel like when you don't feel validated? And then that's when I would go into my meditation state. You know that your body's going through a fight or flight response at this moment. Like you're like, I feel anxious around this topic. I don't even want to talk about this topic. You breathe into that, you feel it. And then I would do a meditation during that time. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to release this limiting belief. I didn't even know that I had it. It took a while for me to find it. And then now you're like just releasing its charge. And then the next time it happens, I'm like, oh, I don't even have that. I don't feel that same physiological feeling anymore of my hand um, like sweating or feeling like that I'm not enough, feeling I'm not worthy enough to have this. I'm only worth as much as as much money as I have. <laughs> Um, but that's not true. Like, I don't even feel that anymore. And you can only do that when you lean into the feeling, really, really feel the feeling and then release it. A lot of people don't lean into that feeling. So they keep that feeling and that charge inside of them. And then they switch topics and never address it ever again. <laughs> and so like a hormone circulating it has to come out of you, but it, they're keeping it inside. Right. Um, I mean, a lot of this, it, it ties into manifesting as well. Like, and, and I know you talk a lot about manifesting and affirmations, like changing your thoughts. And, and so why don't you go into like, what is your, your favorite like techniques for manifesting? Like what has absolutely worked for you that you can recommend everyone do? Yeah, it's going to sound very simple, but just like, um, I think we're not logical people. I think we're biological. I would always, always recommend you like taking care of your body first, because sometimes when we're manifesting, like, this is what I would do. Like, when I'm manifesting and I'm angry, like, you can't manifest on your <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, so, like, 
most people, when they're angry, like, did you have enough to eat today? Did you get enough sleep? They're trying to do all of these manifestation methods with like no sleep, not a healthy diet, really like their biology is out of whack. And they're like, well, I'm always irritable and angry all the time. I can't think a happy thought. I'm always sad. And they're like, okay, so what did you eat today? <laughs> Right. So I'm like, basically the foundation is not ready. Yeah. People want to skip to the end of manifestation. I'm going to get whatever I want and get the life of my dreams. But like, hey, before you get over there, like, let's take care of your foundation. Let's take care of your body. You fight the battle on the ground before you fight the battle in the air. You have to take care of this first. And I know like in the spiritual community, it's like, you know, we're a soul and a body. But yes, you chose to be a body. Let's take care of your body first before like you could really even hear your soul speaking. It's like, I'm hungry. I'm too hungry to do this. <laughs> yeah. And so taking care of your body first. And I think for me, like um, clearing a lot of like, you know, the, your self-healing journey is really, really important. Because a lot of your limiting beliefs are tied to that. So before you're like trying to manifest the life of your dreams, it's like, who am I now? Like, where am I at now so that I know where to go? Because if I'm, if I don't even know where I am on this map, like I can't be where I'm at. People like, um, people are always like looking towards that future, that future manifestation, but they don't even know where they currently are. And that takes like, okay, here, this is, um, my body, this is my finance, this is my relationships, this is my work and career. Find out where that is first and like, okay, where do I want to go? And like, how do I, how do I um, fix this or how do I make this better so that I can be where I'm at? So like picking one for my manifestation technique, I figure out where I am. So um, like my health, like this is where I am health wise. And like, this is where I want to be. So I'm going to meditate on a very specific thing, like a body weight, a body type, like face, hair. And it's very specific to each thing. Um, I'm not like looking to get a specific thing, but I'm looking to like go in that direction. Um, and then once I pick it, then it's really just meditation. Um, yeah. Meditating is key. I don't know anyone who has made a million dollars that does not meditate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all of your manifesting is basically during meditation. You like visualize it. And that's where the work yes. is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Manifesting is from visualization and uh, and meditation. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if you went into it, but what is the science behind manifestation? Um, the science behind manifestation, I think... We are living in a world with technologies amazing. Um, you can literally quantify like your gravitational pull. So the idea of manifesting is like you're exhibiting, like you're emitting an electromagnetic field. And in this electromagnetic field, that's basically like how much pull or magnetism that you have. So a lower vibrational emotion, say you're like depressed, like that's like a 10. You're like right here. You can see mm -hmm. it's like an inch away from you. And you're telling the universe, I want this. And then the universe says, yes, you can have it. But you're like, your magnet's only like this, oh, like an inch away from you. The, the lower your vibration is, the lower your, or the smaller your field Energy is. field. Your energy exactly. Field. Oh, your electromagnetic whoa. Kinetic field. Okay, um, the, your electromagnetic field is this big. <laughs> and you're like, I want it. And the universe is like, heck yeah, you can have it exist. It's right there. You can have it. Um, but this person, if you are angry, it's not saying that your manifestation, manifestation is not going to happen. Like your energy field's only one inch away from you, for example. You have to do more work. You have to walk around. You have to <laughs> like be next to the right person. Like you have to oh. do more work almost because like you can only have this much pull to get them into your reality. So this is a person that has to work harder um, versus if you are happy, ecstatic, full of joy, um, you're radiating at 500, 500 hertz. That's amazing. You're like 20 feet. You're like away from this building. And I'm like, hey, I want this. It's like, Ear. It's going to come to um, me. I had no, I have to do less work. I don't have to walk around. I don't have to interact because it's like, it's, I have more gravitational pull to bring that into my reality. So your vibration and your frequency is this measurable frequency. We call it the emotional vibration scale. And it's literally you, you vibrate at that level. Like, you know, when people can see auras, when people can see like, oh, we're vibing well together, it's measurable. And in that measurement, when uh, some people, you know, who are lower vibrational can still get what they want. It's usually by proximity. They just happen yeah. to be walking around around the right person. 
But if you want to get something more that's really beyond your reach, increasing your frequency, like your electromagnetic pull, you can grab anything in this energy field that you've created. And it's not this like woo woo energy field. It's like a measurable, actual, you are a magnet that's being powered. And again, by your pineal gland. Well, all of your chakra centers has emits energy. And then the one that broadcasts it out is your pineal gland to get it out. So okay. each center emits its own energy. It almost adds it up and it goes blah, 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 blah. And it comes up from around you. <laughs> so that energy you're saying is a magnet. Right. Yes. It's yeah, an electro. Yeah. You are a magnet. Like uh, yeah. as a scientific fact, you are a magnet. <laughs> it depends how big of a charge that you carry, though. That is so have interesting. Have you charged your magnet? <laughs> <laughs> like I have done like chak- aura readings, chakra readings or whatever those are called. And I've seen like colors. Um, it, it's cool that I think scientific people are getting more and more like open to this topic because like in spirituality, chakras have always been a thing, right? For thousands of years. And now it's literally measurable. And and my question is, is this the same energy as like people's emotions? Like when you feel like, like when someone's happy, it's contagious. Or when someone's even sad, that's also contagious, right? Like you start to feel a little lower as well. Is it the same thing? It's exactly the same thing. Your vibration, that electromagnetic field that you're emitting is directly tied to your emotions. So when you are feeling sad, you're probably vibrating at 20 to 30 hertz. And so when you're next to someone, so like say I'm not I'm physically present with you, but if I'm in the same room as you, can, and then can't you feel like someone's presence just like right behind oh, yeah. you? You yeah. feel their energy, even though you don't see them. It's that pull. You literally do have an electromagnetic field around you. And if you're emitting that vibration, if that person is like near your vibration, they'll feel you, they'll be more empathetic towards you. Um, Versus like if you're vibrating at 700, which is like happy, um, love, gratitude, and I'm at 20, like if we will kind of like our, it's math really, it's really just math. You'll see their full Either you're going to just go little. It depends on if you want to dip and you have the capacity to dip. That's why most people who are at high vibration have more capacity or that person can like, you know, just being around someone that's happy, you could raise their vibration, like literally mathematically raise theirs and you make them feel better. The closer you are to someone, say if you're talking to me face to face, but if you were to put a hand around um, my shoulders, you could literally feel the vibration shifting because our... It's like a covalent bond. (laughs) It's it's like two atoms going together and we're sharing electrons. (laughs) It's everything to me, like just science. It's all of it. It's like interactions with other people. And I always think of it like cells. So we're all interacting. We're all like bonding in a different way. I had a random question pop up. What is your view on like hugging? Because then when you hug people, you're like sharing your energy. And like, sometimes you, you don't want to share people <laughs> vibrations with people yeah, who are low. No, or, I'm I don't know. so not into hugging. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm really, really um, happy and ecstatic. I will hug them. I will hug them. Oh, yeah. But then yeah. if they're like very sus, I'm like, hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> But I like, I'm so okay. careful of my energy because you can get pulled into that so easily. Oh, um, and so people will, people will attach to your energy, especially if you have good energy. Interesting. Okay. Um, there is something else that you talk about that I want you to share with our listeners. It's like something about e- EMDR treatment or the bilateral movement of your eyes. EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Very fancy words. Basically, your eye movements control a lot of your brain. So you have your optic nerves that contr- uh, that like go back to your brain. Um, when you do that, uh, well, even right now we're talking to each other. When we talk to each other, our eyes have to move. If your eyes don't move, it's like hard for you to think, right? It, like you know, when you're like talking to someone, it's literally constantly shuffling. Mm-hmm. Um, So eye movement is really, really important when you go into REM sleeping. This fast flutter, it's dreamlike. You're able to dream in REM. Um, So when you're doing that, um, we we found there's a correlation between mental health and EMDR. When people are, EMDR therapy is usually for people with like mental health issues or PTSD. Um, It's this bilateral left and right motion. So when you're doing this bilateral left and right motion, it puts your eyes in a state of hypnosis. So you know when you're swinging a pendulum left and right, 
it calms your system down because, um, you know, thousands of years ago when we're hunting and gathering, we're always scanning left and right. Oh, we're safe. Oh, we're safe. There's not a lion here. Everything's fine. And it calms us down because it gives us that security that we're safe. Now, if there's a lion in the room, you're like, stop. I want to look up and down. What is that? Like, and then it gives you a heightened sense of anxiety. Um, anxiety, the spider fight response. It's really, really good when you need to look, run from a lion. Um, you also feel that way too, that up and down when you see an attractive person in the room and then you look at them up and down and then your, your heart like flutters. You get a sense of heightened awareness and it literally changes, changes our physiologically, uh, changes us physiologically. So our eye movements is directly correlated to our body. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that left and right motion is really, really calming to our nervous system. That's why driving on the road, that's why it puts you in a state of hypnosis because you're constantly scanning left and right over and over again. And it puts you in a state of hypnosis automatically. Um, but then when you see a car accident, you're like, oh, up and down. And then you're like, oh my gosh, there's a car accident. And then you get a heightened sense of awareness. Um, uh, you can also see like um, stop signs, they're, they're like up. So when it's you have to look up so you get more awareness when you like look up at street lights. Um, when it cops behind you, you look at that um, the mirror in the top and you're like, oh, I have to look up. And in looking up, it gives you a fight or flight response. <laughs> yeah, it's something so simple that I'm like, oh, that that's so good to know. It's just so to clarify for our listeners, like basically when your eyes are looking left to right, you are like it, you're, it helps your brain enter a calm state. But when you look up and down, it enters like the fight or flight. Yes. Okay. And I was literally like taking a walk outside yesterday. I was like, per I was like, this is good for me because I'm looking left and right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that simulation, like your eye simulation is so good. Like, especially when you're going on a walk, I want to go into that. You know, when you go on a walk and you see trees and you see grass and stuff, you know how much fluttering of those, like your, your mind gets a kick out of it. It loves being in nature so much because all of that stimulus from like, just look how many um, leaves are, leaves are on a tree, like, and it flutters in the wind, your eyes like, like, wow, amazing. Uh -huh. Like it literally <laughs> gets a kick out of it because it gets so much stimulation. Whereas if you look on your phone and you have this pixelation, that's why people are addicted to their phones because it has all those pixelations now, like what they're like, even more pixelated. So our eyes really gravitate towards that stimulus. So um, now we have like these HD phones, like really great quality um, that our eyes are really, really glued to it now because it has so many flickering. Um, whereas if you go outside and get like natural white light instead of blue light from your phone, it calms us down even more because right. it's almost, uh, it wants to feel safe. It wants to feel that stimulus, that flickering. It's like really, really good for our mental health. Yeah. There was something else you said in your video. I know I do with my dog. Um, I, there's something else you mentioned in the end of your video, like, like what's the direction your eyes are moving when you're scrolling your phone? It's up and down. So literally when you're on TikTok, Instagram, you're like, for so long, for hours, you're putting your body in like the fight or flight or stress. Constant or state, <laughs> constant like state of fight or flight. Yeah, and then you get addicted to that anxiety. <laughs> People love fight. I mean, this is a, I don't know if this is a personal professional opinion, but we're not so far from our ancestors. I think people want to fight. Like, I know this is so funny to say, but like we are like fighters. We are hunter gatherers. We are like, we're not so far in the evolutionary scale to not fight. So when we do have that fight or flight response, people get addicted to it because it's like, I'm doing something, I'm fighting. Like, you know, like it, it's that call to action and people are like, want to act. <laughs> yeah. But they get addicted to that anxiety. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, they're like, I'm just anxious. I don't know why. <laughs> We're all anxious and we don't know why. You've been turning your phone for like hours. <laughs> exactly. Like it's, uh, yeah, it's putting us into like that fight or flight and it's getting us addicted to that feeling because it's, there's also like the dopamine hit you get from scrolling, right? So it's fun and exciting, but it's not good for our brains. <laughs> no, not at all. Like, you know, people can't sleep anymore. Like sleep apnea, insomnia is so common right now, especially at my clinic. And um, I, I also had talked about this too earlier, or 
actually the hormone systems. So melatonin is what helps us go to sleep, right? Melatonin is a hormone, um, is a precursor to serotonin, which makes us happy. It's a mood stabilizer. So melatonin and serotonin is like closely related. It's basically the, a precursor. So serotonin helps us be happy. But if you look at your phone first thing in the morning, um, it converts over to like, it's using blue light stimulation. So what I mean by that is to convert melatonin over to serotonin, you need light. That's like the main conversion. So natural light, white light from the sun. Um, when you see white light from the sun, it's like, okay, 16 hours later, I will like start producing melatonin again, and then we'll convert over to serotonin. But if the first thing you like look at is your phone in the morning, now you're getting blue light. So one, your circadian rhythm is going to be off because your body doesn't know when to go back to sleep. And two, it doesn't do that full conversion. It's an artificial light that's like, I don't know how to like convert it really to serotonin. Like it'll still convert to serotonin, don't get me wrong. But it's like, would you rather convert your serotonin with blue light or natural white light from right. the sun? So you're saying light is what converts melatonin to serotonin? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And then serotonin is the, what's it called? Hormone for happiness. Yes, it's a mood stabilizer. <laughs> Interesting. So we need natural light when we wake up. I think that makes a lot of sense. Another thing I do want to ask you about is healing frequencies. Everything's energy, everything's vibration. So frequencies are also a type, it, it is energy. So how, how have frequencies healed people? How, like, how does it work? Um, yeah, so energy, um, you measure energy through hertz. That's so just like, you know, we measure length through inches. So we measure it in hertz. So each part of your system vibrates at a certain frequency. So you're vibrating right now, I'm vibrating right now. Everything in the world's vibrating. And then there's this homeostasis vibration that's happening within each organ system. So when something is not vibrating correctly, it like doesn't know how to build almost. It's kind of like, uh, when you look at it from a microscopic level, say like mitosis is when like you create new cells. Um, mitosis is this rhythmic dance. Everything's flowing together. Everything looks amazing. Um, it's doing this very rhythmic dance when you create new cells. But if your vibration, if the music is off, almost the hurts, the frequency is off. It's like their dance is like, you ever try to dance and then the music just like is very messy. You can't dance. So there's no rhythm. There's no beat. It's hard for them to dance. It's like saying like, hey, can you hand me a hammer? And they throw you a screwdriver and they're like, yep, I'm going to build a cell right now. That's fine. I'll do it with this. <laughs> and so you're not like giving it the right rhythm to dance in because everything in life is very rhythmic. Um, so vibration is really important for healing. So each organ is has a very specific vibration. And the vibration that we use for cellular regeneration, everyone's different, but the one that we use for healing is 528 hertz. Something about that hertz is 528 hertz. It's like, um, it's a healing frequency. It's your cellular regeneration. It's that, that music that you play so that your cells can dance together fluidly and like beautifully. Um, when it's not playing that, it's a disruption in the music. It's like, you know, you ever try to clean and you're not playing music and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like everything's so monotonous, but it's better when you play some sort of music so that you kind of groove with it and it makes it go better. Yeah, it's just a music. Frequency is music. Everything is like, like this harmony and this rhythm. Yeah, but is there a reason why it's specifically like 528? Because I know there's different frequencies, but how did they know what's for what? what? <laughs> you know, uh, there, there is this like varied research um, that was found about uh, cancer treatment. And so when I was working with cancer patients, so before I was doing like brain stuff, I was working in cancer research. And in that research, we were just recommending things to the patients that we know to be helpful for that. Um, we say a lot of recommendations and one of the re recommendations, besides like diet exercise, there's other things. It's like, hey, we found that there was a correlation with people who listen to 528 hertz in their healing process than people mm -hmm. who don't. And then some people were like, I'm gonna do it, I will try everything. And other people were like, I don't believe in that Eastern medicine woo -woo stuff, I'm not gonna listen to that. <laughs> and so we found that the people who did listen to it, their tumors shrank. Some of them were like, were completely in remission. Everything was great. Like everything like healed perfectly. There is a correlation. So, you know, it, um, it's more of a correlation than a causation. It doesn't like, like not healing frequencies will not cause cancer. But okay. there was a really big correlation that that it works. 
Like, and we have studies to prove it. And, you know, of course, where most people just like want to see, um, to see like drugs, chemotherapy, like they want to rush into that. But Mm -hmm. again, we're like more biology, like let's see what we could do without any side effects. So we (laughs) would recommend the more holistic stuff as well. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, in that position, why, like, why wouldn't you try it? Like it doesn't hurt to try, right? Exactly. (laughs) Some people also just give up. (laughs) They're like, I already have it. I'm done. I've seen people, it's really sad. Like they were on their way to healing on their way. We're looking at their bone scans. Like it's you are good. You're good to go, sir. And she was like, so convinced he was going to die. And I think that's how strong limiting beliefs could be. Like he was so convinced. He already said goodbye to everybody. He was ready. In our scan, he was completely clear of cancer, but he still had, he still had passed because he almost convinced himself with that limiting belief. And I've seen that happen not just once. I've seen that multiple times. It's really your belief systems. If we go back to like manifesting too, there's like what you believe, really, really, really believe like if you fight for your limiting beliefs, you get to keep them. Wow. Yeah. I, let's let's talk more about that because you've seen like this happen in real life where cancer pays, like it, it really is based on their belief because there are people who like, like there are people who have cancer, but some survive and some don't. And so what else have you seen about it? Like, like have you seen people change Yes, 100% yes. Um, Everyone comes in differently. Like, and this is a very sensitive topic because some people are like, I do believe, I do believe. And then they get worse and worse. Some people think they believe, but do they really? And then also you don't want to blame it, right? So what what is your take on it? Uh, It really, every cancer is a little bit different. So you're not like honing in on one. Some cancers are, okay, this is um, my belief. Um, I think the cancer grows depending on where it is. So women, like we tend to carry energy in our heart. And so we are very open in our heart. And I think that's why a lot of women get cancer. (laughs) And then men hold a lot of their energy in their prostate. They don't get breast cancer. They hold it in their prostate. So a lot of men get that kind of... So every single organ does a different thing. It's like where where you stored your energy, where you stored your self-limiting belief. There's this book, it's Bessel van der Kolk, Your Body Keeps Score. Mm-hmm. And it's a really great book. I would recommend it for anyone who's healing their traumas. Um, we do, our body does keep score. You don't know where it stores your memories and your traumas. Your cells are not, your brain isn't the only place that folds memories. Like again, when you're walking by the tree, why does your fist clench up? Your brain didn't tell it to, to um, clench up, but each part of our cell holds a specific memory. So when I'm talking about like something as deep as cancer, but it could be any illness, like we store in different parts of our body. And then we also see this in like when you do um, acupuncture, you know how like, or acupressure in your feet, like different parts of your brain, like or different parts of your trauma likes to attach to different organs. So it's very, um, cancer, again, it's a very deep topic. And I'm, I don't like to go there because it can get personal for people. For me, like it's something that's been building for a very long time like something uh something as big as a really big tumor it's not just like I got woke up and got cancer one day it's like it's been building and building and building and building and you just want to like you know radiate it so that it goes away but really like what caused that to happen what was the beliefs that you've carried for for years and years and years and years and years that caused it to get that big and so people like think, I believe, but it's the surface level of belief. They really, really have to believe into the middle of their tumor until it kind of collapses. So some people's belief system um, don't go away as fast as they do. And if I were to like bring it back to what we we're talking about earlier about getting into a theta state and meditation, you really need to tap into yourself in a subconscious level to really, really change that belief. Mm-hmm. And you can do that by meditating. You don't even, like you can say, I believe and say your affirmations all day. But if you're not meditating and getting into that subconscious level, then it's almost worthless. Not worthless. It'll like in repetition. It'll just be harder, harder to change who you are, what your beliefs are. Mm -hmm. Um, So to get a little more clarity on when you're like meditating in that theta state, say you want to like, you know, believe something, like say you want to believe something or you want to change a belief. How do you phrase it? Do you literally phrase it as like, I believe blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm releasing a belief, like um, 
thank you for serving me at the time and I'm ready to release you. So like, thank you for, I, you were here for, I, I give it gratitude. Like, I'm so happy and thankful. Like you, you release it with gratitude because they were there not to torment you. They were there to protect you. You've got it because it protected you at the time. And now you're stepping into a new season where you don't need it anymore. And so a lot of people like want to hold on to it, you know, like, even traumas, like they hold on to it because it's protected them. Um, and then they get into, uh, let's say the next relationship holding their traumas and like, it protected me my last relationship. It's going to protect me now. Um, but it's that releasing, like, thank you for protecting me in my last one. I'm ready to release you and let go of you so that I can, um, you know, do and then say whatever affirmation that you want. So I could love deeper. So I can love another person differently because we want to hold on to what we've already had that it's hard to get something new it's like hey universe I want all of this and you're like hey your hands are a little full there <laughs> I can't <laughs> and so it's the idea of releasing that so that you have more room and same thing for money too like money is like the bigger you hand to give the bigger you hand to receive because it's like it wants to flow out of you and so releasing that self love really gives you a bigger hand to hold more money <laughs> yeah yeah Amazing. Okay. So we're kind of getting towards the end of the episode. So I want to ask, are there any other brain hacks that you absolutely want to share with our listeners? It's not a hack. It's been there for thousands of years, but meditating and really meditating. And I'm not just saying like, you know, eat healthy and exercise. That's not, um, oh, eat healthy and exercise. I guess I should say that too. Um, <laughs> it's we are... <laughs> We are biological, not logical. We can't jump into manifestation if our biology is not there. We can't think happier if our body is not allowing us to almost. Right. Like you have to like truly feel that high happiness vibration like from the inside. It can't just be like, oh, I think I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Right? Yeah. It's like you're saying, I'm so happy and grateful. And your body's like, but I'm starving. <laughs> It's really tackling the battle on the ground before you tackle the battle in the air because we are really just biological people. And so we hack our biology by getting those things like really taking care of our bodies because when you really, really love yourself, you'll take care of yourself in that way. Yeah, awesome. Okay, Jonah, where can we find you online? And you can find me on TikTok, Road to Roses. And I also have an Instagram, Jonah Rose, J-O-N-N-A-R-O-S-E. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not very active online, but I will be there for people if they need me, if they like message me. Yeah. I'm everyone. I'll share her links down below. Make sure you watch her TikTok and check her out because she has so much other knowledge that we didn't get into in this podcast. Like for example, the water, you know, the, the water molecule, thoughts and water. <laughs> um, I have, okay, so this is a book, it's Hidden Messages in Water. It's by Masaru Moto. Basically he... <laughs> You brought it up. So he crystallized water molecules after saying something to them. Um, when he said words like gratitude, thank you. Um, it's this beautiful crystallization. And it's just, it It almost, uh, your body is 70 to 80% water. So when you're always in gratitude, it's forming these crystals. Whereas you were saying negative things to your body or to other people, it doesn't even form crystallizations in these pressures. It's like, you fool or you're stupid, you make me sick. So all of these negative words don't even form these crystals. But yeah, there's like, uh, and it has to do with frequency. <laughs> when you speak, it's you're measuring the frequency of your words and it translates into the water. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. So <laughs> we'll link that book down below. That's a whole other topic we can get into another time. Um, I'm also curious, Jonah, what's next for you? Like, what are your goals? Are you, you know, since you have this career, you have your TikTok, but you mentioned you're not active online. Like, do you want to be more active? What, what's, what's next for you? Yeah, I'm actually working on a meditation clinic. So all of the things that I've been saying, a lot of people are like, I don't know if I'm meditating right. Am I, how, do I, how do I know if I'm manifesting? And I was like, well, you can't know unless you look, just like your brain. You don't know what's there unless you look. You don't know if you're an alpha unless you look. So the next thing I'm working on right now is opening my clinic. It's basically my idea would be hooking people up into the EEG and like, hey, you're in beta right now. I want you to take a couple breaths and we'll try to get you to alpha. It's this meditation training um, oh. because, you know, you could sit and like try to meditate. I'm like, am I there? Do I feel happy? 
<laughs> or you actually see it for yourself. Most people do feel it, but I think there's this feedback where you're like, okay, I'm in theta. And so we also do therapies like, I want to like when I'm doing a therapy session with someone like I don't want you to talk to me in beta I want you to talk to me in alpha <laughs> because you know you can lie to your therapist all day and then you don't you come out and you're like I'm not changed I don't feel any different but if you get to a different state then <laughs> you're able to open more you're able to connect more you're able to like rewrite that subconscious pattern so that is what I'm working on right now <laughs> Yeah. No, I love that. I think that's so awesome. I'm excited for you. I'm going to keep following your journey. Um, everybody, make sure you check out Jonah Rose. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me.